Hello friends, my name is Benjamin, and today I want to tell you another chilling story. Every person in this life wants to find his love, with whom he dreams of living until the end of his life. But unfortunately, not all love stories have a happy ending. Haley Anderson, the youngest child of Karen and Gordon Anderson, was born in Westbury. Following her high school graduation, she pursued a nursing major at Binghamton University Medical Center. During her first three years of study, Haley worked part-time at a coffee shop, later securing a position in the emergency department of a hospital in Long Island. From a young age, Haley aspired to work in a hospital environment to help people. Described as strong, independent, kind, and always smiling, Haley had numerous friends. She held a fondness for the hippie subculture, believing in spending youth engaged in entertainment and fostering open relationships. On the 8th of March, 2018, a Thursday, Haley spent the late hours playing board games and drinking with her roommates. The gathering concluded just before 4 a.m., and they all went to bed. When Haley's roommate, Josie Arden, woke up a few hours later, she initially didn't find it alarming that Haley wasn't in bed, given their independent college lifestyles. However, as the day progressed, and Haley failed to show up at a planned meeting with Josie and other friends at a bar, concerns grew. Notably, Haley hadn't posted anything on her social media throughout the day, and calls and messages to her cell phone went unanswered. Worried, Josie, along with another roommate, decided to use the Find My Friends app to track Haley's iPhone, which led them to a house on Oak Street. This was the residence of Orlando Tercero, another student in the nursing program who had a brief on-and-off dating history with Haley spanning a little over a year. Orlando, originally from Miami with roots in Nicaragua, was known for his academic diligence during the week and a penchant for partying during his free time. Josie, accompanied by another roommate, Michelle Topali, headed to Oak Street to investigate Haley's whereabouts. Earlier on the same day, the police had been summoned to the residence on Oak Street following a request from Orlando's sister for a welfare check, prompted by a distressing text message she had received from him. Upon arriving, the police received no response, and the house seemed unoccupied, so they departed, finding nothing seemingly amiss. Later, when Josie and Michelle reached the location, their knocks on the door yielded no response and the house appeared deserted. Despite this, they chose to remain, fueled by their concerns for Haley's well-being. Observing that Orlando's car was absent, they relied on their tracking app, which indicated Haley's phone was still inside. To investigate further, Josie assisted Michelle in entering through an open window and they discovered Haley in Orlando's bedroom, partially covered by the bedclothes. Although not certain, her pallor led them to suspect she might be deceased. Swiftly, they dialed 911, and both the police and emergency services soon arrived, confirming Haley's tragic demise. The cause was determined to be strangulation, and Orlando was nowhere to be found. Haley and Orlando had an on-and-off relationship, with Haley ultimately deciding to end it. While she wished to maintain a friendship, Orlando desired a more committed connection. Over the course of approximately a year, Orlando sought a serious relationship, a desire not reciprocated by Haley, who preferred not to be tied down during her college years. The investigation brought to light a troubling incident that occurred six months prior to Haley's tragic discovery. On September 15, 2017, during a party, Orlando was observed shouting at Haley upon learning that she had reconciled with her ex-boyfriend, Kevin Ocampo. Unhappy with this development, Orlando insisted on an exclusive relationship, a proposition Haley declined, expressing her desire to remain friends. That night, Kevin stayed over at Haley's apartment. The following morning, upon leaving, he discovered that the tires on Haley's car had been slashed. Haley reported the incident to the police, but Orlando denied any involvement. Given that the damages exceeded $600, it could lead to felony charges. To prevent Orlando from facing severe consequences, Haley opted not to press charges on the condition that he would pay for the damaged tires. Haley's friends informed the police that Orlando exhibited signs of obsession with her, making unannounced visits, driving by her apartment, 
and seemingly keeping constant watch over her. Despite this, Haley maintained contact with him, not wanting him to feel excluded, as she still harbored some fondness for him. As the investigation delved into the events following Haley's board game night with friends, the focus shifted to how she ended up at Orlando's residence. Surveillance cameras in the vicinity and outside Orlando's house played a crucial role. The footage indicated that Haley and Orlando entered his house together, with Haley appearing fine and entering willingly. Hours later, Orlando was seen leaving the house alone, disposing of garbage, and subsequently going to a local pharmacy to purchase sleeping aids, Zuzquil and melatonin, before returning home. Subsequent footage revealed Orlando leaving again seven hours later and descending to the basement of the house. Police suspected that, at this point, Orlando attempted to take his own life using hooks and a rope, resulting in injury. Blood on the basement floor supported this theory. They found what they believed was a suicide note written in Spanish, and the English translation read, I'm really sorry about this. I never felt I could be capable of doing this. Father, I'll see you soon. Orlando's father had died five years earlier. They believed the note was not just a suicide note, but a confession too. The surveillance footage documented Orlando leaving the house later with a suitcase, and authorities traced his movements to JFK International Airport. He was found to have boarded a flight to Nicaragua, leveraging his dual citizenship, with his mother still residing in the country. Despite the dual citizenship, U.S. authorities charged Orlando with second-degree murder in the hope of initiating extradition proceedings. However, in Nicaragua, due to his citizenship status, extradition was not mandatory. Nevertheless, Nicaragua launched an extensive search for Orlando and located him in a hospital in the city of Leon, just five days after Haley's death. He was seeking medical treatment for injuries sustained during his suicide attempt. The extradition process became a prolonged exchange between U.S. and Nicaraguan authorities, spanning over a year. Eventually, the Nicaraguan authorities believed they had gathered enough evidence to charge Orlando and proceed with the trial. Contrary to the expectations of U.S. authorities, the trial would take place in Nicaragua, and the charges differed from those in the United States. Orlando was charged with femicide, a specific hate crime in Nicaragua, involving the murder of a woman based on her gender and a previous relationship with the perpetrator. The differences extended to the courtroom proceedings as well. In Nicaragua, there was no jury. A judge would hear the arguments from the prosecution and defense before rendering a judgment. Additionally, Orlando was not required to enter a plea. In the prosecution's case, it was asserted that Haley willingly entered Orlando's house, and shortly thereafter, he strangled her to death, possibly while she was asleep. The prosecution argued that Orlando's obsession with Haley reached a dangerous point, contending that if he couldn't have her, no one else should. They theorized that in a fit of jealous rage, fueled by Haley's rejection of a serious relationship, Orlando strangled her. This alleged rage had supposedly been building up for six months, originating from a party where Orlando discovered Haley had reunited with her ex-boyfriend. Witnesses from the United States testified via teleconferencing, providing accounts of Orlando's obsessive behavior towards Haley, including driving by and calling her apartment, as well as details about the slashed tires incident. The judge reviewed surveillance footage from outside Orlando's house, showing him entering with Haley and leaving alone. The court also heard about Orlando's suicide attempt and the note he left for his family, providing additional context to the events surrounding Haley's tragic death. Dr. James Terzian, the pathologist who conducted Haley's autopsy, testified that the cause of her death was asphyxiation by neck compression. The court learned that Haley had been asphyxiated through manual neck compression, with an element of ligature strangulation evident due to the involvement of the necklace she was wearing. According to the prosecution, Haley was murdered because she chose not to be in a relationship with Orlando, a decision he strongly disagreed with. 
The defense presented the case that Orlando had absolutely no recollection of the events that transpired that night. They argued that, due to alcohol consumption, Orlando was temporarily insane at the time of Haley's death. The defense called only one witness, psychiatrist Dr. Ronald Lopez Aguilar, to testify about Orlando's mental state. Dr. Lopez Aguilar informed the court that Orlando claimed to have no memory of the murder. Orlando stated that he had consumed a large amount of alcohol that night and woke up to discover Haley dead with no knowledge of what had transpired. The psychiatrist further conveyed to the court that it was impossible to determine Orlando's state of mind at the time of the murder. However, in terms of his current mental state, Dr. Lopez Aguilar asserted that there were no discernible issues. The defense contended that Orlando, not known for violence, might have been provoked, introducing complexity to the understanding of the events leading to Haley's tragic death. After a 90-minute deliberation, Judge Fabiola Betancourt returned with a verdict, declaring Orlando guilty. She expressed that Orlando's actions stemmed from his refusal to accept Haley's autonomy in making relationship decisions. Judge Betancourt concluded that Orlando had taken Haley's life as a form of punishment for rejecting him. For the charge of femicide, she sentenced Orlando to the maximum term of 30 years in prison, emphasizing the fundamental right of all women to life. Broome County District Attorney Steve Cornwell, who closely followed the case, remarked on the unprecedented collaboration between two governments and law enforcement agencies. Despite initial concerns, authorities in the United States were satisfied with the seriousness of the trial, emphasizing that it was not a mere spectacle, but a genuinely earnest legal proceeding. Orlando chose to appeal his conviction, and the appeal was heard by three magistrates in Nicaragua. The defense reiterated its argument of Orlando being drunk and temporarily insane during the murder. However, they requested a new psychiatric evaluation for the appeal, advocating for a forensic psychiatrist with expertise in temporary insanity defenses rather than a court-appointed psychiatrist, as was the case during the trial. The defense, during the appeal, argued that Orlando should not have been charged with femicide, contending that if convicted of second-degree murder in the U.S., the resulting sentence would have been less than the 30 years he received for femicide. They sought a review of the sentence on this basis. However, the magistrates rejected the appeal for a new psychiatrist and declined to reduce Orlando's sentence. He was instructed to remain in prison, serving the 30-year term handed down during the trial. Law enforcement authorities in the U.S. made it clear that if Orlando were ever released and returned to the U.S., they would promptly arrest him for a second-degree murder trial. Following the court's decision, Haley's parents, Karen and Gordon Anderson, expressed their gratitude to the court. Karen acknowledged that she had not witnessed any remorse from Orlando, but rather regret for not being able to reduce his sentence. She remarked that, while she believed 30 years was insufficient, she appreciated the court's efforts in convicting him to the fullest extent of the law. Gordon expressed his belief that justice had been served and extended his gratitude to the Nicaraguan court system. He emphasized the importance of remembering Haley for the compassionate person she was, a vibrant individual with a zest for life, dedicated to spreading joy and love. What do you think about this story? Share your opinions in the comments. Thanks for watching and for being with us. Take care of yourself and your loved ones.